Um, I will be covering some housekeeping items to get started. So today's webinar is um, Data Privacy Legislation Picking Up Speed, State and Federal Update. We do want to let you know that we are recording this webinar. Each attendee today will receive a copy of the recording following the event. Um, we also would welcome your questions throughout today's webinar, so please submit them at any time using the Q&A window, which you can see in the top. It's circled on the screen here in orange. Um, the Q&A is where we monitor the questions that come in. We will be responding to questions as they come up and as we are able to, uh, but we'll also have time at the end, about 15 minutes, to respond to any questions. We'll also, you know, are always open to receiving your questions over email or following up after the event. If you'd like to email us a question or contact us directly, you can do so at info at dmdconnects.com and we'll share that email uh, at the end on the screen um, for you as well. We'll also have one poll during today's webinar. You can see the poll, which is right next to the Q&A tab. Uh, but when the poll is live, it will pop up on your screen and you'll be able to respond to it there. So with that, I would like to turn it uh, to introduce our speaker today, David Ream, Chief Privacy Officer. David has been a leader in the digital marketing of healthcare products since he led the team that launched the first branded pharmaceutical website in 1995. As DMD's Chief Privacy Officer, David oversees the compliance and data ethics of all DMD products, from the industry's number one physician email database to the Audience Identity Manager platform. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everybody. I am glad that you find this topic interesting. I, I find it interesting, and I think it's really important for all of us marketers and, and those us that service marketing um, industry in the in the healthcare markets, and so I, I I think this is an important topic. I'm glad you're here today. I'd like to start off by putting this concept of data privacy in context with some other of the important things that are going on in our markets. I think one way to do this is to is to share a quote from John Bigelow who's executive director of the Coalition for Healthcare Communications. If you know that group, they're a nonprofit group that um, is, it, they focus on watching legislation at both the state and federal level for issues that affect healthcare marketing, great organization, and um, very bipartisan and, and not connected to any you know, provider. But um, John recently said that data privacy is one of the top issues facing the healthcare industry. For those that might be curious, the other two that he thinks are big are um, regulation of pricing of pharmaceutical products and regulation of advertising of healthcare products and services. So this puts data privacy right up there in the important areas of things that we should be talking about. This uh, webinar is an update of a webinar that DMD did uh, back just about five months ago now. And if you didn't see that webinar, that's fine. I introduced some of the basic topics of the law in California called CCPA and some of the other, um, what some of the other states and, and, and the federal thing was doing. Um, if you missed it, no problem. I'm not gonna repeat that same ground, but I think you won't be lost, you know, joining this one. It's also on our website, um, dmdconnects.com. And so if you want to go there in the resource section, you can watch it at a later time. So we're going to update some of the topics we talked about there and also update in general, um, we're going to focus on legislation that's happening both at the state and the federal level. Okay, so with that, but before I get to the U.S. Uh, situation, I do want to talk about GDPR. And I'm not going to go into GDPR in any great detail. I assume all of you know what that is, the data privacy legislation that was put into Europe, in place in Europe, just about a year ago now. And what's very interesting is, in a way, this is the grandfather of U.S. Um, law, but on the other side, it's only a year old, so it's the youngest grandfather ever. 
But I think there are some things that are instructive from looking at the situation in Europe and uh, that are instructive for the U.S. market and where we may be going. So I'm going to spend about five minutes just covering some of the stuff we've learned in the last year from the European implementation. So from the May start date to the end of the year, December 31st, um, regulators in Europe had received about 95,000 formal complaints related to privacy issues covered by GDPR. This does not include court cases. This is simply complaints to the regulators. And that's, that's a lot of complaints. I mean, I think we knew that this was going to be a hot topic. And, and certainly pro proved out that way. Um, again, you know, many of these complaints are legitimate, but uh, quite a few are not. You know, they're, they're basically class action suits put together because, you know, lawyers or groups are trying to get money from the people involved. So um, this is definitely kind of a mixed bag in terms of all these people flooding into the, um, into the market with their complaints. There have been quite a few fines levied, even in the first year of GDPR. The largest was a $50 million euro fine against Google in France. Um, specifically, the wording of that fine was that they found that Google had, while Google had complied with the GDPR consent requirements, they had spread it over five different screens. And the regulators found that that was a, quote, excessive amount of screens to spread the data over. And of course, what they were worried about is that consumers would um, click yes before they got the whole picture and knew what they were really opting into. The other thing it, that the regulators cited is that Google was, quote, vague in their wording. And so again, um, that's a lot of money to pay to be vague. And so I, I think you will see things like this uh, in, in, in the US too. Uh, we're gonna be talking about that for the rest of the hour on, on some of the challenges on implementing it on our side. This is a phrase that's actually in the regulations, but it really has become kind of a mantra for a lot of people focused on it. And I think it's a very good mantra and one we should pick up in the US and that is data protection by design and by default. By design means intentionally organizing and engineering uh, processes and products to comply with data privacy and data ethics. By default means that it's, it's the natural state of things it's, it's, it's not something that needs to be opted into. Um, it's the way everything starts. And so I, I have seen a few U.S. people starting to use this phrase now, but I think it's, it's a good one internally for your organizations. Think about designing around data privacy and protection and defaulting to that as, as you think about your strategy. There was a, a good Forrester research right at the end of the year and asked, you know, I don't know, a thousand companies, what were the hardest things to implement in GDPR? So this is kind of a, a look backward. The number one thing was data mapping, and that's the process of finding personal information in your organization. Where does it reside? Many times it's in different places. Uh, what personal information is included? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, my company, DMD, middle, medium-sized company, you know, we know where all of our stuff is. It's in one place, and we can point to it. But as, as you grow larger and larger in a multinational company, it's all over the place, right? And so especially big companies finding it very difficult to just find the data they have before they really uh, start to work with it. Second thing that was mentioned is kind of interesting for getting data. GDPR allows a consumer to say, not only do I wanna opt out of your program, but I want you to delete everything you know about me. Now, this is a very common request in, in modern privacy law, you'll see it in California too. But it turns out that this is very anti um, antithesis to what IT, usually, IT organizations usually do. They're usually all about saving data, right? And so deleting data, the, it sort of the rub came when people realized, oh, that meant archived data also. 
right? So we're very big on backing up data. Everybody's got to back up everything. The law specifically says you can't have any data in archives or otherwise in your system. So that has actually sent a lot of IT groups into saying, wow, how do we delete data that's in backup? And um, I, I think that's been a, a kind of a wrinkle. And then the last thing is kind of the whole core of the issue is responding to consumers' requests under these laws. So they have the right to request what data do you know about them? Where did you get that data? They want to opt out of the data. So that whole kind of front end part. Um, Europe uses, GDPR uses a phrase subject access request. I don't think it's a particularly good phrase, but it's part of the law. And so it's used a lot. And in fact, they shorten it to SAR or SARS meaning subject access requests. And I am seeing that nomenclature appear more now in the US. So it's really the, the process of interacting with a consumer. So I, I will be talking about that uh, during this webinar also. Um, in, part, in part because of these SAR, subject access requests, we've seen a new batch of software pop up pre-GDPR, but certainly through that, that whole process that are being referred to as consent management platforms. Now, you know, CMPs, DMPs, DDRs, BDFs, you know, FBIs, we, we, we certainly don't need another acronym, but th these are software platforms that are usually just uh, preference centers on steroids, you know, and they're specifically made to handle things like GDPR and now are being adapted for the US market. And if you don't wanna build your own these are certainly options that, um, that you can consider. I have a short list later in the presentation. And lastly, GDPR mentions, they don't ever mention something called a chief privacy officer. They mention something called a data protection officer. And that's not usually a term we hear in the US much, although I've started to hear it a little bit now. The difference between the two is a privacy officer generally is responsible for the legal compliance. It has a legal uh, connotation, whereas the data protection officer is responsible for the operational component, you know, so those people are usually come out of operations or IT or something. Now, of course, in small companies, many times one person has both responsibilities for remaining compliant and making sure the organization is actually doing it. But in big companies, you're actually seeing a split between these two where the privacy officer will be someone from the legal department and data protection officer will be from operation. And so uh, I am starting to hear these more in the US uh, market. So again, some lessons learned from GDPR as we head into talking about the US side. So we are going to talk about things uh, at the state level first and then some federal level stuff. And we're going to start with California, which was really the first a state in the union to pass one of these laws. Now I covered that law, the CCPA, quite a bit in the last webinar, and you certainly can go back to listen to that. Um, today, I wanted to update you on some amendments that have been proposed in the last five months. Uh, a listening tour, six city listening tour that the attorney general went on to support CCPA earlier this year. What some of the current discussion topics are around this law, and, and you know, we're not in the business of advising you what to do, but, but but what we think you should be doing, what we're seeing other people doing, what we're doing at DMD to be prepared for CCPA. Okay. David, at that point, I think we had a poll um, we wanted to put out there and I'm going to start that now for everyone to respond to. And we'll let it go for another slide here. Okay. So you should see the poll on the right hand side. Uh, if you can go ahead and um, fill that out, that would be interesting. So I want to talk about uh, amendments because we covered the base law a lot in the last webinar. Um, the first amendment was put in in February by the Attorney General and it was actually, uh, the CCPA is pretty rigorous, pretty rig it's not quite as strong as GDPR, but it's pretty rigorous. And it was actually thought that the first couple of amendments would probably make the law, loosen the law up, make it uh, more friendly towards corporations. And in fact, the exact opposite happened. The first amendment, which has three major points, tightened the law up. 
and in all ways made it a little bit harder for businesses to um, comply with. But I'm going to quickly talk about that right now. Um, one of the things they did, one of the big parts of, of um, uh, California, which is not in, in Europe, is that an individual has the right to sue a company in court over violations of this law, and that's called the private right to action. So generally, there's three three actions: a regulatory action, which could happen at the attorney general's level in at the state level, a class action suit, or a private right to action. So California grant, granting individuals um, gives them that gives them a lot of recourse, and and means that companies are going to see more um, more litigation around this. So anyway, the, the way the base law was written is that you could only sue if there was unauthorized access or disclosure of your information. So basically, it would be a data breach. You could sue under a data breach, right? So in this amendment, they expanded it to say, basically, you could sue for any violation of CCPA. So if you believed you had not, if you believed you had given an opt out and that opt out wasn't processed, you could sue for that. And so that, that greatly expands um, what corporations are going to be, you know, held liable to. The second one was there was this nice 30 day cure period, especially in the beginning. So a consumer said to you, hey, I never opted into that program. You better get me out of that. You know, you had 30 days to comply or, or, or you know, if they said, you know, delete all my data, you had 30 days to do it. And if you didn't do it after the 30 days, they could sue you. But if you did do it in the 30 days, they could not sue you. So the second amendment removes that 30 day cure period, which is very, um, makes it much more <laughs> difficult for, for corporations because now, you know, they don't even, uh, consumer doesn't even have to notify you. They can just see you in court and say, hey, you know, you violated the the law in some way, and I'll see you in court. So that's that's tough. And then the third one was there was this ability for companies to be able to submit a formal process to submit um, a request to the attorney general for guidance on how to process this. And 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 the attorney general who filed this amendment removed that. And I think it's if you th look about the FDA, you know, the FDA doesn't really take people's questions right they look for things that violate their general principles and then they 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 make a move on it but you know for those of you that have been around you know when websites first came out we said fda give us some you know give us some guidance on websites and they said nope we're just going to be general it's just like print and then social media again you know it took them years you know to get any guidance out so again, um, uh, in California, we, we will not be able to request the Attorney General gives us guidance. We will only be open if they should so choose to provide guidance. So I think that's going to make it more difficult for states. So anyway, this um, this uh, amendment came out of committee out of subcommittee and went to the Appropriations Committee and has been voted out of the Appropriations Committee. That means it now goes to vote in front of the Senate and the House in California. It's expected to pass. I, I, I think in two to four weeks, it'll probably get voted on and passed, and then we'll go to the governor for signature. So it's not a done deal yet, but it's pretty far down down the road. Um, next, I'm going to talk about an amendment with, that was just introduced a couple weeks ago, again by the attorney general, and really, I'm I'm really excited by this amendment because it really addresses our colleagues in the ad tech business. Um, DMD is not in the ad tech business, but we certainly work with a lot of clients that do, and our identity data, our opted in identity data is the basis for a lot of programmatic um, platforms. And uh, this policy was really not designed with ad tech in mind. And I, I just think they simply didn't under, don't understand ad tech, you know, and so uh, the ad tech folks that serve up, you know, digital media banners, that kind of stuff. We're saying, wait, if I know who this person is, or I kind of think they know who I know who they are, do I have to opt them into my ad before I show them the, the ad? Those are all great questions and not asked, not answered by, by the law itself. And the worst implementation would be, yes, it applies to advertising, which would have really, really messed up digital advertising. 
So I was a little bit surprised when they just introduced this bill that basically is a carve out for ad tech. And, and you can go read it yourself. There's one very important sentence that's the carve out. And it basically says, um, CCPA does not apply to the serving of digital advertising. And again, you'll want to get the tweet, you know, right down. But uh, I think that really, really, really will help out the ad tech industry uh, with this regard. Um, so it's currently in, in subcommittee, and then it's going to go to the appropriations committee and then for vote and then to the governor. And so it's in the beginning of its journey, but I'm very happy to see this, uh, this introduced. David, I want to give the results of our poll now. Um, you know, the question we asked is, where is your organization with regards to preparation for CCPA? About half of you are saying that you're not prepared, that you're still gathering information. And 40% um, of you are saying that you have preparations underway and that, that you feel you'll be ready. Um, you know, no, no one is, no one is, only one person went out there to say they're confident about CPA preparations and only about 8% are 100% ready. So I think, you know, it sounds like most of the audience today is, is still in the preparation and um, information, information gathering phase. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so again, get, get back to updating you about California. So then there's this public forum listening to her. Uh, very good. I think that the attorney general even, you know, suggested doing it. They went to six cities in the U.S. Open mic. You know, anybody could come talk. And um, we've been monitoring that progress. I think four things came kind of came out of those public forums. One is a request for for clarifying key terms, even key terms like what is a business. Um, for instance, they say if you have over twenty five million dollars in revenue. But they don't say, is that $25 million of revenue in California, in the US, global revenue? Um, it's very hard to know if you qualify if things like that aren't uh, really clearly defined. The second point was we talked about you know, responding to consumer requests. It's kind of the bread and butter of, of the law. And there's a lot of questions around that, you know, sort of the form and format of that, of that response. Um, uh, responsibility. David, this brings up a question, um, which is, is CCPA or other legislation mandating how organizations need to reply back to consumer requests for their data? Is there a mandate on how uh, they need to, to send it back or send a uh, reply back? Yeah, it's a good question, Sarah. No, there, well, <laughs> there is and there isn't, right? There's a mandate that you have to take a request, but it doesn't say in what form. Like, can you only have a fax number? Or do you have to have it on your website? Or do you have to have an 800 number? Can you have a non-800 number? All those are questions people are asking, right? And then in your report back, what has to be in the report? What's the minimum format of the report to comply with the law? It is not in the law. So a lot of people are stepping forward and saying, look, we want to be compliant, but you got to help us out and understand what has to be in our reply back to a consumer. So the mandate is there but the form and format are not there. And so, um, again, the worry is that something's going to happen like what happened in Europe with, with, um, with Google, where the regulators say, yeah, you're too vague. You know, well, hey, man, why don't you help me out? <laughs> you know, give, give me a format and I'll do it that way, you know. But um, governments tend to not like to, to define that, and we don't really see that happening so far in, uh, in California. Uh, the third thing is they have this this clause in there that people refer to as the non-discrimination clause. It really has nothing to do with what we might think of just normal discrimination, you know, gender, uh, uh, minority status, sexual status, whatever. It, it's really about you can't offer serve, you can't discriminate against someone that invokes the law. So if someone says, "I want to opt out of a program." You can't deny them access to the program, you know, even though they've they've opted out. And you can't you can't ask that you, or or they've told you you can't hold my data, right? Or you can't ask them for things that aren't essential for for um, the the program itself. I used this example last webinar. You know, say you're opting into an email program, and in the opt-in phase. You, you technically now will not be able to ask for personal information like postal address. 
because the argument is, hey, you don't need that postal address for this thing, you know, and your opt-in is coming into this program and you can't overreach, right? But uh, there's a lot of people that are really concerned about this as they should be. You know, you just take something like loyalty programs, you know, which tend to look to try to define a whole body of information about a member in the loyalty program. Does that mean that you have to allow somebody to be in a loyalty program if they don't give you all the information involved in the loyalty program? Or what about ad supported websites, you know, and you say, hey, you know, you got to do ads. It, 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 I mean, if you give me all this, if you do ads and don't pay me any money, you got to fill out this this um, personal like you know identifier. Or we have this option where you can pay a monthly subscription and not get ads and don't have to fill out a, a profile. Well, can someone do the first one and then opt out of it and then you deny them service? This is these are all questions that are are. A little bit vague and unanswered under the law right now. David, I think somewhat related to that is another audience question, which is, you know, how are you supposed to manage an opt-out list without keeping some of this data? Yeah, I mean, it's a super good question, right? And and this is where the rubber hits the road, and and the law itself is not specific. And we're going to talk in a second about what the attorney general has said, you know, in the last month or so about their guidance. And um, unfortunately, it, it, you know, it, it's going to be one of those things where we're going to have to launch in a in a not quite tight environment, you know. And you would hate to get a fifty million dollar euro fine to find out, you know, how you're supposed to do this. But um, that that is the way it is right now. So the last point was pretty funny in these in these forums, enforcement priorities, all these people that either were small or medium sized businesses or lobbying groups that recommended them were just totally throwing big companies under the bus. And we're, we're saying to the attorney general, don't come after us, go after Google, go after Facebook, you know, that's where the problem is. Don't, you know, just, you know, the, we're not the droids you're looking for. And um, so I, I, I thought that was pretty funny. So um, that was the result of the forum. So what do I think is coming up? So the attorney general after the forum said, hey, thanks for all that input. Um, we're going to think about it, but we're telling you right up front, we're not going to answer all of these questions prior to the, ordin to the ordinance going live um, on, on January 1st. And they said, we're hoping to give guidance in early fall to some of these things but it certainly won't be to all of them. So they've already set an expectation that they're not going to remove all of the vagueness. So that's difficult. But, you know, those of us in healthcare have been living under that uh, with the FDA for, you know, generations practically. And I, I think you should kind of consider it to be the same kind of format. Like we'll just have to do the best we can, make certain assumptions, document it, make best efforts, you know, and, and, and hope that it's gonna work. I think you will definitely see more amendments. I, I think that uh, the ad tech amendment was a good sign that the attorney general is listening. And I, I think that as more of these kind of things come, you know, really bubble up enough, you're going to see more amendments to the law. One thing I think you're not going to see that, that some people have pushed for is a delay in the start of the implementation. Some people say, hey, we're just not going to be ready by January 1st. Remember, on January 1st, you have to be able to report on all of the data usage in 2019. So that, that means it's kind of, you know, even uh, uh, you know, very pertinent right now. So some people have been kind of pushing for a delay in that. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that um, uh, right now that it's, it's likely to still continue to be January 1st. And um, I think it's going to um, be rolling that way forward. So. David, an another question from the audience, which is a question about, you know, what about inferred data such as IP address mapping to geolocation, behavior based, um, such as time of day, those types of things as well. Those yeah, types of data collection. Very, very good point. And, and you know, I, at the last webinar, for instance, I, I brought up IP data, IP addresses, and I said, you know, we, weird, that that is specifically mentioned in the in the law as a piece of personal information. But those of you that know the details know that it might be and it might not be. You know, if it's um, if it's a shared IP or a, 
a, a, a, a, a carousel IP, you know, it, it's not going to go back to an individual. And so uh, that was raised, that particular issue was raised quite a bit in um, the public forums, like, hey, you know, what about you inferred data like that? And um, again, it was just no answers and, and mostly listening. So the nice thing about uh, California is that they mention, they specifically list what they consider to be personal information. You'll, we'll see as we talk about some other states and what they're doing. California has a list of like 10 things, which includes, as I talked about in my last webinar, thermal data and, and um, uh, smell data, whatever they called that, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember what their term for it, but, um, uh, so California is pretty clear on, on what they consider a PI, but other states, you know, kind of not so much. And, um, but even with things I mentioned, like IP, it's, it's questionable whether that really is or not. And I want to add for everyone on the call, I just shared a handout for the uh, recording of that last webinar in November about CCPA. So you can see it under handouts, under shared, and you can download it there. Um, you can also feel free to reach out to me after the event if you'd like a, a direct link to that. I'm happy to share that with you. So sorry, David, go ahead. No, no, I'm good. And I see that it's 2.30 and I'm I'm probably behind where I need to be. I'm, I'm so interested in this stuff. You know, I, I could probably talk about it all the time, but I'll probably pick it up a little bit now to make sure that we get done on time. So where where are we? DMD is a company. Again, again you know, we're, we're a data provider. Uh, we're not involved in the implementation of any of this stuff. We're, we're affected by this stuff the same way many of you are. Um, we have felt data ethics has been very important to us for years. We have the only opt-in uh, database, email database of healthcare practitioners where we have first party relationships with those practitioners. And so all of these laws really support what we've been doing for years and years, but still we wanna be on the leading edge of that. So what are companies like us doing? So the first thing is you get you really probably should have a comprehensive implementation plan at this point as we do and are working through it and um because um you, you want to avoid that last minute rush you know if if possible um we mentioned this earlier one of the things to start with is knowing where your personal information data is and how you're managing it already as i said dmd it's in one big data lake we can point at it you're in a big, huge company. It might be different offices. It might be different, you know, departments, even even countries. You know, so that data mapping is super key to be doing right now because that's the basis of of moving forward. Third is starting to think about how you're going to respond to a request. Again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the particulars of responding to a request are not. Uh, outlined in the law, or have not, been, and have not been clarified by the regulatory committee. So you're going to have to make best efforts. How are you going to accept a request? Electronic, non electronic? How are you going to get that data? There are people supporting GDPR that are still pulling data manually a year later. Are you going to go with a manual thing to start with, or work with uh, a system that automatically pulls and responds to requests? And what are those requests going to look at like again form and format is it going to be a, a, a web browser based display are you going to email something are you going to drop it in the mail postal mail you know how are you going to do that and so you know those are are really um one of my colleagues says at the coal face at the face of the coal mine you know that's right there you know those are that this some of the big questions but again those are based on on data mapping and lastly, I'll go a little bit off, off the range and say, I think you really need to consider what marketing looks like in the age of privacy. And uh, one of the, I think, most uh, meaningful marketing officers in the last 10 years is Mark Pritchett at um, Procter & Gamble. And he's even postulating that in the age of privacy and some of these other things that marketing and advertising even goes away or becomes fundamentally different. And um, I don't know if I'd go that far, but uh really it's 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 a new ball game and it's going to be a legal game you know i i've been around long enough that for 20 years we've been talking about consent-based marketing and permission marketing seth gordon golden and um but really now you know there's going to be teeth and meat to it so i think you need to consider it i think you need to look at your data partners you know make sure all of your data partners are first party relationships with people they're getting data from totally opted in, totally have all this stuff nailed. 
because you don't want them to set you up for failure. Um, some people have asked about software solutions and stuff. Again, you, you know, we're not in this business, but some things we've seen, we've considered ourselves for data mapping, a, a couple of organizations, consent management platforms, con consent management platforms, um, various things uh, available. Again, basically preference centers on steroids. Uh, people have asked us a couple times, any consultants that we know of that know about healthcare and about these data privacy laws, we haven't found anybody yet. If any of you find anybody and you like them, uh, mention them to me and I'll, I'll give them a little plug on the next, uh, next webinar. So I'm now turning to other states other than California. Last time we spoke five months ago, there were eight states considering data privacy legislation. Now there are 16 states. So it's doubled in the last five months. And all of these uh, are, are, they're not just talking about it, there's bills in either the Senate or the House, you know, in each of these states on data privacy. Obviously, uh, California has passed. I'm going to highlight, and I'm going to try to do it kind of briefly, um, three states, Washington, New Jersey, and New York. So, um, oh, before I go to that, I want to show you this kind of interesting, this is actually a, a, a grab from a web page. The, the um, URL is down there in the bottom from one of those consent management companies, Truo, that has this nice page where they monitor uh, state level uh, laws and they have their own proprietary uh, rating system for each law, like how, how strong it is, how, how um, strong for the consumer and um, they, they have this scale that goes up to 117. Um, just as, as a way to you know, gauge it, California on their scale scores a 94. So um, there's still room above California for, for tighter, but um, you can see that there's a range of, um, you know, these laws are definitely not all the exact same, and there's a, a real range of how um, compliant or aggressive that they are in, in terms of, of protecting data privacy. So you can see that this also poses a big challenge. You know, how the heck are you going to manage Illinois and also manage California with the same you know set of processes when they clearly have two very different kinds of approaches. So I'm going to mention Washington real quick. As as you know, all you're all very smart. Seattle's in Washington. Why do we care about Seattle? Because Amazon and Microsoft are both headquarters in Seattle. So you think those two giants are are going to be involved? in a state um, law that governs data privacy. So it was very interesting to watch. Definitely modeled after GDPR uh, a little, they definitely did some things that California did not do. GDPR requires an opt-in. That is a huge, huge hurdle for many programs. Um, many programs do not have an opt-in, you know, and, and GDPR requires it. That's why they had to opt everybody back in. California does not require an opt-in. They have all kinds of other things, which you can check out the last webinar to see. But Washington started out with an opt-in. Again, plug for DMD, only opted in database um, uh, in, in the, the healthcare space for, for email and other identity information. But so states are going to be requiring an opt-in. Um, you know, somebody asked about, you know, referred uh, in, referred personal information. God, Washington's definition is crazy. Where California had maybe 10 specific things that were PI, Washington said anything relating to the identification of a person is PI. Like, well, what, what does that possibly mean? You know, um, facial recognition, you know. Um, everything, you know, and so the, the crazily broad definition of PI. Um, Washington also uses a very central tenant that GDPR has of processor and control. And, and that's also similar to HIPAA has a, a similar kind of consideration. California does not have that consideration, which is the acknowledgement that in the data ecosystem, companies have different relationships with the data. They may be processing it, they may be collecting it and controlling it, and that they should have different rules on them. So California does not do that. Washington did do that. Um, Washington mandates that companies are going to have to spend a bunch of money doing these impact assessments, which you know are going to make it expensive to promote it. Um, one of the big 
uh, pushbacks on California is it's written the way it's written it applies to any consumer data which would involve which would include companies that hold data about their employees probably not the what what the what the writers intended they were probably intending marketing things but that's the way it's written so a lot of the feedback in the forums was hey you know what what can i keep on my employees and what can my employees quote opt out of you know well, I think Washington kind of got ahead of that, and they said that those laws expressly do not apply to the employer-employee relationship. Very interesting. Washington dropped that private right of action, so that was a, that's a very compelling part of the of the California law. Uh, gives individuals the right. Washington did not include that. So again, you see, um, you know, the dramatic differences in the state by state. So this bill was considered a sure thing. Microsoft and Amazon were both supported it. It passed in the Senate 46 to one, but it did not make it through the House in, in, in April. There was a deadline on, the, on putting new laws in and by April 17th to be voted on for this year, and it did not make it. It was a huge surprise to us geeks that follow this stuff. Um, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but basically the AC, ACLU came in and said, no, no, this was a back office deal with Amazon and Microsoft. It does not support the consumer. Um, and uh, Washington is a democratic state, many democratic representatives there. The ACLU said, we will campaign against you for not um, keeping in mind the consumer with this law. And it reached a stalemate and it did not get voted on. Very big surprise. Very, very reminds us all why about politics, you know. And so it's off the docket until maybe uh, next year. So uh, huge surprise. Um, again, I'm going to pick it up a little bit. New Jersey is got a very CCPA kind of uh, law. Um, actually, in some ways, it's narrower than um, California, but still, it's got these outrageous penalties. In California, the penalties are $2,500 and $7,500. And if you multiply these by 10,000 or 20,000 for an email campaign, you see how expensive that could be. Um, New York also kind of similarly, um, very CCPA with that right. They kind of extended into the gender area, gender expression is covered under this. Uh, funny, all the other, um, states have have minimums on who this applies to it does not i mean like california you have to have two hundred thousand consumers you know in your database um new york it applies to every business every business you know joe deli who's got 50 people on his you know list and applies uh to them I haven't set the penalties yet and it's a little farther back in in subcommittee but the reason i brought up these three is that if you take california plus new jersey plus new york that's 25% of all the physicians in the United States. And many people on this call market to physicians. And it shows you that just in just three states rolling over this year, it would be you know, such a significant thing for us to do healthcare marketing that we would definitely have to take it into consideration. I'm now gonna go to the federal level and then uh, to, uh, try to save a few minutes for questions and then wrap it up. So the federal level, everybody and their brother is holding meetings. I have a long list of the groups holding meetings. They're, they're groups as significant as the Judiciary uh, Committee, all the way down to totally bizarre niche groups like uh, National Standards and Institute uh, and Technology Institute. You know, everybody's holding meetings on privacy and trying to you know, get views about it. I hate to say it, but there's kind of a partisan view on looking at Europe. Uh, Republicans are kind of saying, add ah, stifling innovation over there. It's it's providing um, advantages to big companies like Facebook and Google. Um, the Democrats are saying, ah, it's not really protecting the consumers enough. As you can see, there's so many complaints and they're not really moving on it. Both points of view are, are reasonable and probably accurate. Um, it's just kind of how you want to paint the picture. Um, the state, as, as much as we've talked about kind of the vagueness in some of the state laws, man, they are like the encyclopedia compared to these federal things. There's one federal law, I'll even mention that it's Marco Rubio's proposal, that basically says data privacy is a good thing, let's have laws about data privacy. And it, it, it literally could not be more 
um, unhelpful um, in terms of a law. So a lot of these proposals kind of seem almost like positioning, political positioning. Preemption, which is the concept of preempting the state laws, is a huge battleground, huge battleground. And basically, the Democrats are saying, hey, you big companies, we know you want to do a federal law to get over all of these state laws, and we're not going to accept some watered down federal law just so you can get out of consumer protection that all these states want you to do. So basically, the Republicans are saying, yes, a federal law has to preempt state law. And the, and the Democrats are saying there's not going to be any preemption unless the federal law is very compelling. And so this is clearly a huge topic. Um, a year ago, some of the feds were talking about GDPR as a model. Now there's much more discussion about CCPA being the model, which means that you and me should pay a lot of attention to CCPA. Uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's one of the more informed voices on this, is now saying, Let's use CCPA as the model for the federal market. Uh, when I spoke with you five months ago, there were four federal proposals. There are now eight federal proposals. I'm certainly not going to get into the details of all these, but um, just to kind of highlight some of the things where this is going. You, you'll see more Dems up here than Republicans, um, obviously. But some of the, the agreement that these things have is most of them have CCPA-like rights, meaning right to opt out, right to delete, right to correct your data, right to learn where the source of the data was from, that kind of stuff. Most of the proposals envision the FTC being the enforcement agency. That makes sense. The other alternative was to create a new agency like the Consumer Protection Agency that happened um, for finance. Um, the, the, the momentum seems to be around uh, adding this to the FTC's bucket. But the disagreements in the approaches are significant. Uh, we've mentioned a few of these already. Preemption, whether there should be an opt-in or an opt-out. Again, GDPR opts in. Um, we think this. We at DMD think this is key. We don't think you should be marketing to people that haven't. Don't you don't have a first-party relationship with the opt-in? So we would support that. Again, these definitions. We've talked about this. You know, what's a business? What's personal information? You know, all those things are 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 being quibbled about. You know, right now. Fine. Some people are looking at this as big money. I saw one ridiculous one that said a company can only be fined once a year with a maximum of fifty thousand dollars. You know that's never going to fly. And then lastly, we've talked about this private right to action. Can an individual sue? This is a huge issue for for companies because if individuals can sue, there's going to be a lot more litigation. So I want to conclude thoughts and then take some questions. Um, look, this legislation is important to all of us that do marketing. It's it's important for healthcare too, but it's just a general marketing thing, and it, it really will is going to change the environment, and 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 we should all be thinking about it. Uh, this data protection by design and by default is um, is really is really important uh, concept. I think you should bring that back to your organizations and and think about it. I'm going to crowdsource getting a tattoo of this, um, but I, I think it's really that important. Um, you, you really have to be pretty far along the way for CCPA by now. If not, you're going to be in a big rush or you're not going to be ready. And uh, if you're a small company, you're probably okay. But big companies, you know, they've been the targets. They've been the primary targets in Europe so far. So um, it's going to be, you know, just put more of a target on your back. I would not prepare just for California. It's super clear that there's going to be more states that have laws before the federal law comes. And so I would really consider a multi-state support strategy. So even if something's not in California, like opt-in, prepare for that anyway, because that will be a requirement by another state and you sort of want to be you know, the most conservative you can be. Um, as Washington State showed, nothing is a sure thing, and so a lot of people have said this federal law is going to happen, but this is politics, folks, and so timing and, and prediction is, is, is always up in the air, um, which Washington State showed us. And then lastly, I, I think it's still the consensus is a federal law is going to happen. It, it's, it's considered a, quote, bipartisan topic. Um, but I think there's a lot of division between the two. But but looking at all of these federal laws that are proposals, they are, they are far away from being impl implementable. They're just not specific enough. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I think last webinar I said, I think that a law could happen in fall of 2019. I do not think that's gonna happen. I don't think we're gonna get a vote this year. But I think we will get a vote in 2020 because I think it will be an election issue. It's not going to be it's not going to replace some of the real hot buttons. But I think if a candidate has 10 policy proposals, I think data privacy is going to be one of the 10. And it's going to become an election issue that people are going to vote on. So um, I still think it's important and something that we as an industry should be working on. So with that, um, I wanted to leave a little time for, for Q&A, Sarah. Yeah, there's there seems to be you know quite a quite a, based on the questions quite a bit of concern about this multi-state um, you know differences in privacy laws you know and so with so many states considering such different legislation what does it mean in terms of compliance you know how does one consider managing data privacy um, not even just domestically but internationally I mean I, I think a lot of our audience um, has companies that work you know with, not just within the U.S. but you know outside the U.S. as well. Yeah, and a very common question that I've seen a lot of experts address is this question. If I am GDPR compliant, am I CCPA compliant? And I've read this answer 173 times, and the answer is no. If you're GDPR compliant, it does not mean that you're CCPA compliant. You know, there, there, it means you're a good, you're, you're over compliant in some areas, and under compliant in some other areas. So it, it, it still means, you know, that you gotta do, and, and you add on every, you know, every, every new, if Washington State hadn't had that freak thing, it would probably be a law this quarter. You know, you would have to add that in. Um, I'm only the messenger, we're only the messenger. We're just sharing this insight with our friends and colleagues in our industry. We, we, we are not responsible for any of this or do not make a living serving any of this. But what, what I will tell you is it, it is a, um, a difficult process for those of us in either the data business like DMD is or in uh, marketers who use data. And, um, you know, I, I wish I had some, some magic answers, but I don't. It, it's going to be difficult and, um, and vague. And um, the only thing I can say is, you know, kind of similar to the last 20 years into the FDA in my, in my impression, but um, your, your mileage may vary. So I wish I had a better answer, but that's, that's what it is. So when um, looking at this question here that, that we had a little bit ago, what is going to determine which state's laws a company has to abide by. So where, you know, how do you know if you have to abide by California or Washington or New York or New Jersey? So all, they do see, that is one area they kind of agree in. The law governs, well, although here, here is a disagreement, the law governs citizens of those states. And the generally accepted definition of citizen is filing a tax return. You know, which state do you file your primary tax return in? Um, don't get me into the edge cases of I file 10 different states, but most of us file in a state. That's that you're considered resident of that state. So it applies to you in that state. In the California law, they were very specific to say it only applies to California residents who are resident in California. That means their butt is in the chair in California when the interaction happens, right? But Washington state, which as we know, ended up not moving forward, specifically said, doesn't matter where the Washington resident is in the United States. If they're a resident, you have to meet these laws, which is just crazy. This is absolutely crazy, you know, but it, 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 that, that's what it said, you know. And so we are, re I mean, I don't see much way other than querying everybody, you know, when you start to do an opt-in, you're just going to have to query everybody and say, what, you know, Get ask for their zip code or ask them what state they're in. And that's where you need to look to these consent management platforms that are hopefully building, it seems to me, they're building in a lot of this logic on a state by state level and saying, okay, if this is a California resident, then we have to do these kind of things, collect this kind of information, offer these kind of services with regards to that information. I mean, hopefully these third parties see this as a market opportunity for all these businesses that are gonna need it and are gonna, you know, offer it. But it, it, um, 
it is a tangled web we are weaving. So, so going back to the Bill 702, which is saying that CCPA is not applicable to ad tech, is, is, is that what you're saying, is that it's not, that it doesn't apply to ad tech? Um, and if so, why is that? Yeah, well, um, we don't have time to do the long definition. The, the quick way is Google that, you know, California bill, state bill, whatever it was, 702, and you'll get um, both the text of the bill as well as commentary. Also, feel free to reach out to me personally. I'm happy to talk to you about it, but it's pretty, it's not that long and it's pretty clear cut. It, it basically, I mean, there's like one sentence and it says, I mean, one key sentence and it says, California Consumer Protection Agency shall not apply to the serving of digital advertising to California residents or something like that, you know? So, um, uh, again, you, you can do some of your own research. I'm happy to talk to you about it, but um, it, it's, uh, I think anybody involved in that would see it as a, a, a big, big news, you know, that came out just a, a week or two ago. David, would you mind just advancing to the next, um, yeah. the last slide, just as their email address on it, um, you know, info at dmdconnects.com. Um, this screen here that, that David is sharing is our blog series on data privacy, so you can see additional content that we've put on our website um, and, and the link. Um, but on the last slide, I think we have our, our email address. So if you have additional questions, certainly follow up with us and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, had quite a few questions come in and I know we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we are going to follow up with you after um, today's session um, to get you the answers that you're looking for. Um, um, thank, thank you for spending the whole hour. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to more questions. Just a lot of content and my enthusiasm probably uh, ran it long, but we're, we're happy. Again, we're, we're not, you know, these aren't part of our services, but as you know, what we think is the leading supplier of ethical data in this market, we're happy to um, uh, uh, work with you um, to try to, you know, address any of these, these topics that we can. Sounds good. Let's see if we can just get one more here. I think this Ooh, one might be one a, more. A, a, a quick follow on to what you were just yeah. talking about, which is, so what happens if someone signs up, you know, in New Jersey, their information is submitted in New Jersey, but then they are become a resident of California. You know, what happens to that person and what if they don't convey the information to you that, oh, that they've moved oh. and you don't know? Oh, dear Lord. Right. You know, I mean, sure. Yeah. What happens to those people? I, I don't I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, we can make best guesses, right? You know, I, I'm, I mean, same thing with Europe. They were trying to, what they said was implementation or, or I'm sorry, penalties were going to focus initially on the biggest, um, the biggest uh, breakers of the law, you know, which of course they went after Google, you know. Um, and hopefully they're not going to get to these edge cases like that, you know, right away. And, and we'll get some time to work that out. But I mean, that's one, I could riff a hundred of those questions off that there's no known answer to. And so again, it goes all the way back to having, you know, a data strategy, privacy strategy, um, an, an ethics around how you're going to use data and, and and stating that and then following through on it. That's our approach at DMD. You know, in this in this vague breeze, if somebody, for instance, sued us, we'd say, look, we, you know, from the beginning, we have tried to do the right thing in these 27 different ways. And, um, you know, um, that's all we can do under the current law. So, uh, I, I sympathize with the questions and and the frustration behind them, but um, I, I don't believe I have the answer, and I don't believe that anybody else has the answer either. It's just the nature of the situation. Sarah, thank you. I think we're, I thank you. I think we're at time. Um, I do want to just remind everyone that we are going to send out the recording to you following. Um, this event, you may you may get it later today, uh, if not later today, first thing tomorrow morning. So we really appreciate your time today. And again, reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns that we can handle um, following this event. And anyone whose question we didn't get to today, we'll definitely follow up over email within the next um, day or so.